the completion of the high-technology storm surge barrier in the Netherlands, which has been called the eighth wonder of the world. Designed to protect the country from violent North Sea storms, it stretches five miles across the eastern Scheldt. Much of the Western Netherlands has been reclaimed from the sea and lies over three metres below sea level, making it particularly vulnerable to flooding. On a stormy February night in 1953, the dikes collapsed and 1,800 people died in the floods that followed. The new storm barrier consists of 65 concrete piers, each the size of a 13-storey building, each with a sluice gate, which is only closed when a severe storm threatens. By keeping the barrier open for most of the year, the tides remain unaffected and the marine life of the estuary is undisturbed. The key to the successful operation is the British-designed computer software. The computer collects data on wind, tide and weather conditions from sensors far out in the North Sea and gives early warnings about storms or oil pollution so the gates can be closed and we're told there are no storm warnings for noon on Saturday when the Duke and Duchess of York will join Queen Beatrix of the Netherlands in the grand opening of the barrier. On the runway at Manchester Airport just over a year ago, 55 people died in what's been called a survivable accident. There have been plenty of others. 23 deaths in Cincinnati, 123 died near Paris and 301 at Riyadh. And in all of them, the biggest killer was not the fire itself, but poisonous smoke. In Manchester, Michael Mather was lucky enough to be only six rows back from an exit door that opened. Even so, it was the last row in which everybody escaped alive. Michael, just how quickly did the smoke build up? Immediately after the flames come in at the back, the smoke started to roll right along the ceiling and as soon as it hit the front, it swirled back off the bulkhead and started to fill up. How hot was it as well? At the judging, by the way, it was clinging to the ceiling. It was very hot, yes. You could actually feel heat on it as well. So how did you get out? Um, the alley, the aisle down the centre was blocked, so I think I went over the top of the seats, as I remember, and was Paul Clare at the front. Well, Michael, you were obviously very lucky indeed. One person who was not quite so lucky was Michael's friend Claire Bailey here, who sat on the other side of the aisle where she is now. Claire, you obviously breathed a lot more of that smoke. What was it like? It's terrible. It's very hot. Very hot. Just horrible. Did it uh, burn your throat? Oh yes, it's very, it burnt me really badly and I was gasping. And what about your eyes? They were very puffy, very swollen and they were weeping. Now could you actually see with all that smoke? No, I couldn't see anything. I couldn't even see my hand in front of me. And how did you get out then? Well, I managed to crawl out from my seat into the aisle and just by instinct just found my way out. Claire, thank you very much indeed. For nearly all of those who died, their fate was sealed by a few breaths, a lungful of that poisonous smoke. It's been suggested that something over the head, a smoke hood, could have saved many of them. But the Manchester accident investigators were astonished to discover that no one knew how much protection any hood might give against smoke like that. So they decided to find out for themselves. To create a standard aircraft fire, producing a realistic lethal mixture of smoke required all the expertise and finesse of the scientists from the British rubber and plastics industry. They will produce uh, some toxic gas when burning, uh, hydrogen cyanide, nitrogen oxide, carbon monoxide. They're all a problem, plasticised PVC life belt holder. And, underneath and even if that seat itself could be adequately fireproofed, mm -hmm. there's plenty PVC. more. Here we have the um, seat panelling with a polyester window and a polyester PVC surround at the back mm -hmm. of it. And here we have a PVC carpet strip, the carpet itself and a fibreglass panel which goes up into the roof of the aircraft. Quite a brew. And this is one of the hoods that it's hoped will protect against the smoke that all that little lot will make. There's no air supply here, just a filter to breathe through. And guess who's the dummy who's volunteered to put this on in the smoke chamber? No, you're wrong. It's him. A fully mechanically breathing dummy that's been seconded with all his attendant experts from British Coal. Inside here are some tubes which sample the atmosphere, and this samples the temperature inside the mask. And these sample the atmosphere and temperature outside the mask.
That hood will face a fire that's already producing deadly cyanide gas, which these collecting bottles trap, along with corrosive hydrogen chloride, hydrogen fluoride, and several other poisons. Also in that smoke, there's enough carbon dioxide to knock you out fast. And incomplete combustion builds up carbon monoxide to a level that would kill. Okay, test started. And it's getting hot as they compare that with conditions inside the smoke hood. The dummy's mechanical lung sucks and blows, drawing the filtered gases into a second set of bottles. And measurements taken here show that the lung-destroying poisons have all been filtered out. Exhalation distance, 1.5. Calorie temperature, 68.5. It's by CO2, 6.98. Surprisingly, in all that smoke, there's still plenty of life-sustaining oxygen. And there's no carbon monoxide inside the hood. The filter has converted that to carbon dioxide, but using a chemical reaction that gives out heat, which is a problem, because this trace shows the temperature inside the hood is rising, and that too could be dangerous. Half an hour later, the chamber has been cleared of most of the poison gases. I think we'll look at this more closely outside. Well, that's better. And already you can see, in spite of the fact that it's dirty on the outside, the inside has remained very clean. And that's after 10 minutes in the exaggerated situation of the smoke room. And in a real situation, that could mean 20 or 25 minutes in an aircraft fire. But if that's the good news, the bad news is that the temperature inside this smoke hood reached about 90 degrees. But already they're working on a compact heat absorber that would fit behind the filter and bring that temperature down to 50 or even 40 degrees. The other point is, what is the best design of smoke hood? It seems that the airlines might accept a hood of one pound weight or less. So in its present form, this one is still a bit bulky. So the race is on to find one that is more compact and more efficient. Are you ready? Go. Question, is there time for this? Shouldn't they be heading for the exit? Answer, yes, but each second they spend in doing this should buy them a whole extra minute to get there. Some of these bigger hoods are already in service with air crews. So if a fire started in the air, they could perhaps land the aircraft safely. But their passengers might all be dead. So we, the passengers, also need protection. And ideally, the equipment must be light and very simple to operate. Now, this is an example of one of the two main types in the running. It's another filter system. And this is clearly a very light hood indeed. Slightly heavier, but still weighing less than a pound, is this other type of hood, which has its own oxygen supply. There's an oxygen bottle down there. So the passenger should sit quite happily inside his own oxygen balloon. But unlike the one that we saw in the smoke chamber, none of these have actually been through that essential test with the dummy to measure precisely how much of the toxins get through. But uh, undeterred by that, we're going to try it out on ourselves. I've uh, been given this system, which happens to be an oxygen hood, and I've got four live dummies to go with me. All we need now is a dead and burning aircraft. OK, so it doesn't look very realistic, but that's nothing that 200 gallons of flaming kerosene underneath there won't put right. I'm glad to say that we've got a fireman standing by here with plenty of foam, and we also have a medical man. What's the matter? Don't you think these hoods work or something? Well, some of them are still being tested, and I'd like to keep a very close eye on things. I'm glad to hear it. OK, now, uh, let's get this on. As the inferno develops, I'm going to hope to give you live commentary of what's going on inside. Obviously, it's going to be quite noisy inside this. But if the worst comes to the worst, then I come out. But I'm told I must come out after six minutes, so no heroics. There we go. Well, already the fire started in here. The flame's are extremely hot as you get through. In by here, there's another two pots of kerosene under the third seat. It's pitch dark. The temperature in here must be uh, well up to 100 degrees, I would think. The uh, floor. It's getting very hot in the heat. 
flames at the back are roaring about eight or ten feet into the sky. Now, this is uh, one of the filter ones. I don't know if I can hear you in there, but uh, how are you feeling at the moment? Fine. No problem, just this one at the No problem. I can hear you very well. That's, that's very important. So, uh, is, is it very hot in there? No. No? no. <clears throat> Still extremely hot, isn't it? The faces behind me all look fairly comfortable. <laughs> how are we doing? Fine. All right, so far. I, I reckon you filter guys are going to have to leave first, aren't you? Uh, possibly, I don't know. Uh, we've got to try and think uh, in, in terms, like yourself, where yeah. uh, we haven't worn the things before. What effect that would have on a person uh, in the panic situation. But uh, we've been in here a fair time now, if you think about the aircraft is actually working. OK. I think my... Oxygen is beginning to run out. The hiss of the oxygen is beginning to die away. I bet if you're in a, an air crash, that's a pretty welcome sight, if you can see that lot coming at you. Uh, I think I'd better pile on out. Oh. <coughs> wow. Oh, we're covered in foam in, inside there. Now... I suppose, let me get this microphone out. I suppose that uh, the thing that surprised me most about that is the amount of heat that builds up inside there. The smoke was apparently the density that would have been felt at the Manchester air disaster, although the toxicity of it wouldn't have been nearly as high because there were no foams in there to create cyanide gases. But uh, even so, Anybody who hadn't been wearing a hood like this would have felt a lot of difference. In fact, we've heard since that the temperature at Peter's head level rose to a lethal 180 degrees Celsius. So without hoods, Peter and all the others would have been dead. Even so, critics are still worried about the time wasted trying to work out how to get hoods on, then the floundering about in the dark, and maybe being less able to hear. They wonder if passengers really want them. Michael, with your experience, do you think it would have actually delayed you to have put on one of those smoke hoods? Um, not significantly, as long as they were quick and simple to put on with good clear instructions. Well, Claire, what about you? They may have delayed me slightly, but people behind me would have had more of a chance. Absolutely. Thank you very much. But how are they going to be made available? Well, one place that they could be stowed is underneath the seat here, where the life jacket is normally put, but perhaps that's a little inaccessible. They could drop down like this from where the oxygen masks are. Or if they're one of the simple filter hoods, they could even be set in the panel of the table. And at a simple pull of the switch, they could drop out and your smoke hood would be there for you. Well, we still need an agreed standard for the performance of the hoods, and that should be one of the subjects discussed when the director of the American Federal Aviation Authority is over here next week. But if the British Air Transport Users Committee have their way, they'd like to see them within 18 months. And as a direct result of the Manchester disaster, British Airlines could be the first in the world to provide full smoke protection for passengers. That's good news. So till next Thursday, good night. One on Saturday, the Noel Edmonds Late Late Breakfast Show. It's a new live run. There are many new features, including the claim to fame and the golden gauntlet. The Hit Squad and Golden Egg Awards are back, and Mike Smith takes the Whirly Wheelers through their paces. There are major prizes to be won in Smitty's Challenge. Plus, there's a viewer's special telephone password each week. Yes, the Late Late Breakfast Show is back. It's good old, mature, adult self. You must watch it live this Saturday, 10 past 6 on BBC One.